O Jesus, blessed Redeemer, sent from the heart of God, hold us who bow before Thee, near to the heart of God. Some people don't have enough faith to not be healed, so all God can do is heal them. I told that to my wife one day. We were driving to a speaking appointment, and she was doing the driving. She said, "Um, what are you going to talk about? I said, I'm going to talk about how some people don't have enough faith to not be healed. So all God can do is heal them. She said, that's terrible. (laughs) You're not going to do that? I said, yes. I think this is an important point. She said, well, how will the people who have been healed feel? I said, that's their problem. (laughs) Um, Well, it didn't go very well. She began driving faster (laughs) and jerkier and... um, but I, uh, I've tried to say it better. I don't know how to say it better because I'd like to shock you into your attention tonight on a major point, a major point that has escaped us. We have thought for a long time that if we have enough faith, we can be healed. No, no. If we have enough faith, we may not be healed. It takes a lot of faith to not be healed. Some of us grew up with some gross misunderstandings. We um, read bedtime stories. I'm not going to tell you whose. And we got the impression that if you're good, everything is going to go good. And if you're bad, everything is going to go bad. And like the uh, teenagers would say of yesteryear now, I guess, not... We forget that all of Jesus' disciples except one died a martyr's death. And uh, that one was was banished on a lonely island. We forget that the Apostle Paul, who wrote 14 books in the New Testament, was refused his request for healing, and God finally told him not to pray about it anymore. We forget that John the Baptist perished alone in the dungeon. And people have often wondered about that one. John the Baptist, about whom Jesus said, there was never one born greater. We forget that um, Elisha, who received a double portion of Elijah's spirit, did not go to heaven in two chariots. He died after a long, lingering illness, maybe cancer. And he was so godly that when they dropped the body of a soldier on his grave, you remember, the soldier came back to life. Um, We forget these things. We forget the last few verses of Hebrews 11. Oh, we love to read the first part of Hebrews 11. All of these great success stories. And we uh, remind each other of them, and we get the impression that if we had enough faith, this could all happen to us. But right in the middle of verse 35 of Hebrews 11, right midstream, the account changes. Notice how it reads. Women received their dead raised to life again. Wonderful. And others were tortured, not accepting deliverance that they might obtain a better resurrection. And others had trial of cruel mockings and scourgings, yea, moreover, of bonds and imprisonment. They were stoned, they were sawn asunder, were tempted, were slain with the sword, They wandered about in sheepskins and goatskins, being destitute, afflicted, tormented, of whom the world was not worthy. They wandered in deserts and in mountains and in dens and caves of the earth. And these all, having obtained a good report through faith, 
received not the promise. So these mighty giants of faith received not the promise. What was going on? Is there something that we have missed? I'd like to remind you of a very significant honor guard that is very important in God's system. I'd like to read three verses. First one, Philippians, the first chapter, verse 29, For unto you it is given in the behalf of Christ not only to believe on him, but also to suffer for his sake. Philippians, the third chapter, the Apostle Paul gives his profit and loss statement and how that all of his accomplishments and his pedigree mean nothing if he doesn't know Jesus. And then he says in verse 10, that I may know him, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings. The fellowship of his sufferings. And then Peter says it probably best of all. First Peter, the fourth chapter, verse 12. Beloved, think it not strange concerning the fiery trial which is to try you, as though some strange thing happened unto you. But rejoice inasmuch as ye are partakers of Christ's sufferings, that when his glory shall be revealed, ye may be glad also with exceeding joy. Fellowship with Christ in suffering. Uh, right here I would like to remind you that uh, the stories that we have often told, that we love to tell, need to have another perspective. You know the stories. The uh, grasshoppers come and they stop at the fence of the tithe payer. They eat all of the neighbor's crops. We love those stories. And we get the impression that that's the way it's supposed to be with everybody. That's why I like the story of the man who had dedicated his property to the Lord. And he was a tithe payer. And the grasshoppers came and jumped the fence and ate all of his crops too. Then the neighbors came along and they made fun. Ha ha, what do you have to say now? He said, if the good Lord wants to graze his grasshoppers on his own property, that's his business. In the meantime, I will still love him and trust him just the same. Now, if you look at it carefully, you discover that God needs this kind of honor guard. People who prove that they are not rice Christians, they do not serve God because of what they can get out of him. They serve him regardless of what happens. And that this is what real faith is all about. In fact, I'm going to go one further. I'm going to confess that when pastors get together and talk, some of us who have been pastors for a while, like a hundred years or so, we acknowledge that the number of times that we have had uh, miracles that we could count, uh, we probably could count on our fingers, maybe even the fingers of one hand. during our entire ministry. And as you look at the Bible record, here is the premise. In most cases, people born on the wrong planet, like you and I were, do not find God intervening to overrule the bumps and bruises of life. He walks with us. He stays with us. But in most cases, he does not work miracles to change the situation. We have failed to look at this as we should. And that's why we need to take a long look at something that is written concerning John the Baptist. You can read about it in the book Desire of Ages on the Life of Christ. Toward the end of that chapter about John. 
are some famous lines. They go something like this. Not Enoch, who was translated to heaven, nor Elijah, who ascended in a fiery chariot, were greater or more honored than John the Baptist, who perished alone in a dungeon. And of all the gifts that heaven can bestow, fellowship with Christ in suffering is the most weighty gift and the highest honor. Take a look at this, neighbor, because it might overlap into your life, the life of your loved ones. It has overlapped into the life of the voice of prophecy. You're probably aware that Harold Richards <clears throat> had many prayers going up for him. I mean, people all around the world were praying for him. He told me not long ago, he said, um, Maury, uh, on my 80th birthday... I'll take you anywhere you want to go to eat. And now it looks like uh, it will be to the tree of life. I think he was trying to make a statement to me that day because he knew that it wasn't long. So, here's another one that joined the honor guard that had enough faith to not be healed. Recently, we were trying to move from California to Arkansas, which some people thought was a great mistake. And um, I was going through 150 boxes out in my garage, <clears throat> boxes that have been the bane of my wife's existence. <laughs> she said, you haven't opened them for 10 years. Just take them and dump them in the dumpster. Oh, no, I said, there, there's got to be at least one thing in the middle of every one of those boxes that I cannot be without. <laughs> and sure enough, <clears throat> here's one of them. I found it, a poem written by someone who wrote a lot of poems, even some songs. The name was Anonymous. <clears throat> And as I went down through the poem, I did not get it at first. It's pretty deep. It's pretty heavy. In fact, it is so heavy that I had to read it over and over and over again. And little by little, it began to come clear. I am so anxious that you understand just a little bit about this poem that I'm going to give it twice now and at the end of my talk. See if you can roll with it here right to begin with. There is a peace that cometh after sorrow, of hope surrendered, not of hope fulfilled. A peace that looketh not upon tomorrow, but calmly on the tempest that is stilled. A peace that does not live in joy's excesses, nor in the happy life of love secure, but in unfailing strength the heart possesses, from conflicts won while learning to endure. A peace there is in sacrifice secluded, a life subdued from will and passion free. Tis not the peace that over Eden brooded, but that which triumphed in Gethsemane. Thy will be done. It is not God's will that people suffer, but it is God's will that he have an honor guard who will continue to love him and trust him regardless. In fact, in most cases, he needs them and does not intervene with miracles in most cases. And so that is my major premise tonight. It takes a lot of faith to not be healed. It takes a lot of faith to not be delivered. It takes a lot of faith to not have your prayers answered the way you would like to have them answered. It takes a lot of faith. Now I'm going to tell you a story. I uh, debated whether to tell it. It's hard to tell, but it's fresh. It happened last year in the Seattle, Washington area. There is a family there, been on the faculty of Audubon Academy. 
the Allens, Tom and Trenda Allen and their two children, their son, Travis, 18 years old, found out that he had leukemia ten months before Thanksgiving last. And um, it didn't look good. You're not supposed to get children's leukemia when you're 18 years old. He did. There was little hope to offer. They did the usual. He lost his hair as he went through the chemo and the other things as they tried. And um, then it looked like uh, the only course would be a continued downward course as things got worse and worse. His mother is a nurse, and uh, she got permission to stay by his bedside 24 hours a day when he was in the hospital, although once in a while he'd have a reprieve and would be home for a few days, which were special times. But most of the time in the hospital, his mother by his side 24 hours a day. Early on, the church became concerned, the community, Auburn Academy, students. He was a senior, senior class. And uh, they began praying for special help. There was a special anointing service with the elders and the oil. But nothing changed. And as he continued to grow worse, he began to become concerned about his eternal destiny. And he shared his concern. And someone came along and tried to give him help by telling him, just make sure that you have all of your sins confessed. Have you ever heard that one? Oh, I wonder if I forgot one. Didn't seem to help a whole lot. And then one day our son, who was the pastor there, and for which reason we have a, sort of an in-house account of this whole story, was able to communicate with Travis there in the hospital the good news that our eternal destiny is not based upon anything we do. It's based upon what Jesus has done and our continuing acceptance of what Jesus has done. It got through like a revelation and... Uh, he became excited about the good news. And he stopped looking to himself for some kind of salvation there. He looked away from himself to Jesus. And he found peace. And he rejoiced and was happy about it. But things continued to get worse as far as his health were concerned. Our uh, grandson, Chris, happened to be Travis's best friend, another reason why we know all about this story. They were both seniors. They had been together from the fifth grade. And Chris would go and visit Travis once in a while all by himself as things began to <clears throat> get even worse. Uh, Travis said to Chris one day, Chris, I'd like you to promise me something. Okay, he said, what is it? He said that you'll meet me in heaven because I want to hang out with you up there. He said, we've been best friends since the fifth grade, and I really want to hang out with you up there. I'll tell you something. <clears throat> Grandpa couldn't have come close to that altar call. <clears throat> Not even close. And Chris promised him. Well, as things went downhill, the weeks went by, one day our son, the pastor, was visiting with Travis and said, uh, would you mind if I take some notes of a few questions with your answers? Because <clears throat> I'd like to have a record of some of the things we talk about. No, he said, that's all right. He said, how has your thinking changed? Have you... Have your thoughts changed much during these weeks and months have been going by? Oh, yes, he said. I used to think the most important things in life were, number one, to have fun, number two, to get things, and number three, to be cool. 
Now I'm convinced that there's only one thing that's important, to know Jesus. Yes, he said, there have been some big, big changes. Now, in spite of the fact that he had peace concerning his eternal destiny, he would still wake up at night sometimes with this fear overwhelming him. And he would awaken his mother. This happened more than once. She would be sitting by his bed, sleeping and dozing, and he would say, Mom, yeah? And she would shake herself, and she would try to ask God to give her a little strength to be of some kind of encouragement. Mom, I'm scared. I don't want to die at 18. And more than once she said to him, Son, if you do, you'll go to sleep and you'll wake up right away and you'll look into Jesus' face and Jesus will look into your face. Can you uh, try and visualize that? Okay, Mom. Just think about that moment when you look into his face and he looks into your face. Okay, Mom, I feel better. Well, there was another thing that happened to him as uh, the days and weeks went by. Sometimes he'd wake up in the night with this, Why me? Why me? Have you ever said that? Why me? It was sort of like another voice causing him discouragement and darkness. And one night, all on his own, the Holy Spirit came through to him with something like uh, that statement concerning John the Baptist. Of all the gifts that heaven can bestow, fellowship with Christ in suffering is the most weighty gift and the highest honor. And he said to himself, well, if God needs someone to go through an experience like this and still love him and trust him just as much, then why not me? And every time that that dark question haunted him in the night, why me, he would always counter with, why not me? And as faith grew, the peace deepened, and the joy, in spite of the circumstances. The senior class came to their annual Do Something Stupid Day. Uh, what do they call it? I don't know. Ditch Day or whatever. <clears throat> when they usually went off and had some fun, you know, and guess what they decided to do? to go visit Travis in the hospital. So the seniors all showed up. He was embarrassed. He was skin and bones, and he didn't have any hair, so he wore his baseball cap. And they gathered around, and they reminisced, and they talked, and they laughed, and they had a good time. And Travis was overwhelmed that his classmates would do this for him. <clears throat> he couldn't forget it. He decided that they were really something else. One day he said to our son, uh, Pastor, I would like to be anointed again. And, and our son froze. I mean, he knew that they'd already had this experience and, and nothing had changed. And uh, so he kind of gulped, and he said, well, uh, uh, Travis, uh, we had this anointing already, and uh, nothing changed. How did you... F he said, no, 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 I don't want to have another anointing in order to be healed. I would like to have another anointing service to celebrate the peace that God has given me. And they... They were impressed, and they began to try and schedule it at the right time, but it was uh, 
rather tricky now because Travis was having times of great pain and unconsciousness even. And they thought maybe they had waited too long, but uh, one day they thought, well, we better go ahead. There were 200 people at the church praying when the pastor and father and mother and the beloved Bible teacher went in to have the anointing again. Uh, Travis was unconscious. They stood there for a little bit and said, well, I guess we better go ahead anyway. So they got to the head of the bed and they began to pray. And as soon as they began to pray, Travis sat up perfectly clear. And as they prayed, he put his hand on his father's neck and massaged his neck. And he put his other hand on our son, the pastor's neck, and massaged his neck. And he rejoiced over the hope and the peace and even the joy that God had given him. Five doctors came by to uh, try and share with him what the remaining options were. It was late in the whole process. Uh, the options were not good. None of them were any good. And as they, as they tried to describe to him what the options were and try to get his feeling on what he would like them to do, he said, no, he said, don't do anything special. He said, I'm going to go to sleep. But I'm going to wake up right away and I'm going to see Jesus. And one of the doctors said, I, uh, I'm glad that that concept brings you comfort. Travis looked at him and said, Doctor, that's not just a concept, that's in your Bible. An oncology social worker came by. She came by to help the family in the... Uh, Afflicted one to face, you know, the finale. Uh, the doctor looked at the oncology social worker and said, that You're not needed here. And she said, I beg your pardon. I came, you know, to do my thing to, to help with the family and with the you know, help. He said, uh, Did you hear me? You're not needed here. I kind of like that part. There were bigger forces at work. Well, some of them began praying that as he approached the end, that uh, God would see fit to do something special in terms of giving him a moment of comfort. Sort of like Stephen, you remember when he looked up as he was being stoned and he saw Jesus standing up in his behalf. You remember that story? So he said, God, if, if you don't see best to change things, <clears throat> could you please give him a moment of comfort when it comes to the finale? came to the uh, last weekend before Thanksgiving. And of all things, he was able to go home for a couple days. So he went home, and uh, on Sunday, our grandson went over and took a wheelchair Got him in the wheelchair and um, took him to the mall, <laughs> and they did the mall. They were together for eight hours. They laughed. They had a meaningful time. Our grandson told us later that he was so happy he was able to spend that time with him that day. Monday morning. He woke up and he said, uh, <clears throat> I'm not doing good 
Dad, you better get me back to the hospital. So they put him in the car and they started for the hospital. They didn't know that uh, he was bleeding to death internally. And this process made him feel like he had to stop at the restroom. So he said, you better stop. They stopped at Denny's. They uh, put his arms around mother and father's neck and they helped him walk into the Denny's restaurant. As they came in, the receptionist said, uh, you, you want a table for three? She said, are you okay? I said, uh, we need... So she showed them to the restroom. It was a small restroom with only two stalls. Both of the doors were open. There was nobody in there. His father uh, chose to pass the first one and go into the handicap stall. Mother stayed at the door to the restroom. Uh, Tom was trying to help his son in there when he looked underneath the partition and saw a pair of shoes on the other side and what appeared to be the trousers of a dark blue silk suit. He was sort of uh, irritated by it because uh, he had thought that he was in there with his son alone and he would prefer to be. As he was trying to help his son, his uh, son said to him, Dad, I'm not doing good. I can hardly breathe. At which moment a voice came over from the other side, which called him by name and said, Travis, it's all right, you're going to be okay. Travis said, uh, Dad, you better call 911. I can't breathe. And uh, his dad left to call 911. His mother came in, trying to help him. And the voice continued to come from the other side. Travis, it's all right. I'm here. You're going to be okay. His mother got him out on the floor, and he was lying on the floor when the paramedics came in. It so happened that they were within three to five minutes of Denny's. And as they came in, they uh, put him on a stretcher. At this point, the stranger from the other stall came out, went to the head of the stretcher and leaned over and looked into Travis's face. And Travis, who had been looking at his mother, was suddenly riveted on the face of the stranger. The paramedics said to him, Are you his father? He said, No, I'm his friend. And he continued to lean over Travis's face as they took him out to the ambulance. And he followed all the way, reassuring him and telling him that it was going to be okay. When they got to the ambulance, uh, Travis was unconscious, and then the stranger was gone. They compared notes later and agreed that none of them, <clears throat> none of them had seen the stranger's face, except for Travis. Uh, 
they even went into the uh, receptionist at Denny's and they said, uh, did you see someone come in here in a dark blue silk suit? And the receptionist said, uh, people in dark blue silk suits don't come into Denny's. And they took him to a nearby helicopter <clears throat> to transport him downtown to the Children's Hospital in Seattle. Father and mother got in their car, and they uh, drove 40 miles in 27 minutes during rush hour. They arrived at the hospital before the helicopter did, which would have been some kind of miracle in itself. And they were there when the helicopter landed and uh, brought Travis down. And uh, Travis died in his mother's arms at 10 o'clock on Monday morning. He had asked that they have the service on Friday, and he wanted it to end at sundown. So they scheduled the service that way. The church was packed. There were fellow classmates from other years that had come in, busloads from Walla Walla College, even some from Southern College, some from Pacific Union College. There were 34 of the doctors and nurses from Children's Hospital that came to the service because they had been so amazed by what had been going on. It was arranged that the seniors would come down the center aisle and they would uh, divide and go on each side and up into the choir loft where they sat and they had left one chair vacant in the middle with a rose on it. Our son, who had taken notes for months, tried to share with the people there what Travis had said in answer to his questions, including how his thinking had changed. And among some of the questions was this one, what do you think of your senior classmates? And he had said, I can't believe it, that they would do what they did for me. He said, you guys are awesome. And he said, I uh, want to see you all in heaven. And if any of you are not there, I'm really going to be bummed. <laughs> they had hoped and prayed for a revival on the campus. They did not know it would come in that way. Needless to say, there has been a revival on the campus. Because someone had enough faith to not be healed. We went to visit at Thanksgiving, and um, we heard again the story that we had heard over the phone. And we asked if we could go down to Denny's. <clears throat> so we did. And we took turns going in the restroom. And as I stood there by myself, I thought, uh, how could someone from the heavenly country come into this smelly place? And if someone from the heavenly country would come into this place, they deserve to wear a dark blue silk suit. <clears throat> and then the picture changed a little. 
because someone from the heavenly country did come to this smelly place. And because of it, we all have hope. Well, you know, you speculate about this story. I um, told it at the Voice of Prophecy earlier this year, and Bob Edwards, my friend, told me afterwards if it hadn't been you telling the story, I wouldn't have believed it. I don't know what he meant by that, um, except that we've been friends for a while, and he uh, sort of trusted me that I wasn't making it up. It's a hard story to tell. But I think it's a beautiful story. And it reminds us that of all the gifts that heaven can bestow, fellowship with Christ in suffering is the most weighty gift and the highest honor. Are you ready for my poem? Listen carefully. There is a peace that cometh after sorrow of hope surrendered, not of hope fulfilled. A peace that looketh not upon tomorrow, but calmly on the tempest that is stilled. A peace that does not live in joy's excesses, nor in the happy life of love secure, but in unfailing strength the heart possesses, from conflicts won while learning to endure. A peace there is in sacrifice secluded, a life subdued from will and passion free. Tis not the peace that over Eden brooded, but that which triumphed in Gethsemane. Thy will be done. I think it would be real special right now if we could listen to the quartets sing... Amazing grace, <clears throat> please. Could I ask you, in his words, wouldn't you like to hang out in heaven? <laughs> and if anyone is missing, wouldn't you be bummed? <laughs> I'd like to invite you, neighbor, <clears throat> to make a strong decision that this is your top priority. And to look toward heaven right now and thank Jesus for making it possible. Dear Lord, please help us to love you and trust you and to have enough faith to continue that way regardless of what happens to us. Thank you for the honor guard that have gone before. And thank you for Jesus and the friendly arms of the cross showing us the way. In his name we pray. Amen.